So welcome back everyone. It's now time for our last um, panel with or without UK, the post-Brexit area of freedom, security and justice. So this morning we had the chance to listen to some very brilliant talks about the impact of Brexit on the UK in these um, policy areas with uh, some focus on security, both internal and external security. Uh, also some content about justice, about uh, migration. But this afternoon we'll focus on how and to what extent the area of freedom, security and justice, which is one of the main objectives of the European Union, uh, has uh, evolved now that the UK is no longer a, a member state. So we are very happy with uh, Helena to, to welcome three distinguished uh, speakers this afternoon. We will offer us some complimentary thoughts and insights uh, on this topic. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Chloe Berrier, then we have uh, Camino Mortera Martinez, and then we finish with Professor uh, Florian Throner. So um, I'll start with uh, Chloe's introduction, and then I will leave you at the floor. So um, Chloe is Associate Professor of EU Law and Director of the Center for European Law at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Her research notably addresses the EU's external relations in, crim in criminal matters, and she also published a monograph building upon her PhD uh, dissertation entitled The External Dimension of the EU's Policy Against Trafficking in uh, Human uh, Beings. So this was published uh, this year uh, at Hart uh, Publishing. And uh, Chloe has also published a lot about uh, cooperation in criminal matters between the EU and the UK in post-Brexit time. So, uh, Chloe, the, the floor is now yours. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, and so thank you, Agathe and Elena, for, for, the, for the organization of the seminar and, uh, and the, the invitation to participate in the workshop. Uh, after lunch, I'll try to be as dynamic and brief as I can uh, to discuss one aspect that has been touched upon a bit by previous speakers, um, but I'll try to, to bring also new elements. So uh, my presentation today will focus on one aspect of the EU area of freedom, security and justice, which is cooperation in criminal matters. Um, an area, uh, a policy field in which the EU has developed actors, instruments, uh, new mechanisms of cooperation that have led to the existence of uh, what has been called by some the EU area of criminal justice, uh, in which the UK has taken part for, for many years as an EU member state. Um, while I will uh, focus briefly, my, my, my presentation will focus on three main points. I will briefly recall the UK contribution to this EU area of criminal justice to see what is lost uh, with this uh, withdrawal from the EU how the UK can cooperate now with the EU in these matters, but I will, and how it is um, integrating itself among the groups of EU of uh, non-EU countries or third countries with whom the EU has developed collaboration in this field. And whether, uh, finally, I will discuss how the EU area of criminal justice is currently developing without the UK as, as a part of it. Um, so to recall briefly the, the, the position of the UK towards the um, development of the EU area of criminal justice. Um, I just wanted to recall, as it has been said already by, by, the, the, by Sergio Linking in his keynote speech, but also by other um, speakers earlier this morning, that the, the UK has played a, a key role in the development of this uh, field of cooperation, supporting um, the establishment of EU actors like Europol and Eurojust, uh, promoting at EU level certain um, um, models like in the field of police cooperation with the, the, the promotion of the model of intelligence-led policing that we see now uh, existing at EU level with the impact uh, priorities and uh, um, policy cycle. But the UK has also um, benefited as it has been stressed by Elena in her introduction or uh, by Dr. Karnert in his, in his uh, uh, talks of a certain exceptional treatment um, with uh, a series of derogation specific arrangements that allowed them to tailor uh, really its participation to this EU area of criminal justice, picking uh, specific instruments in which to participate and disregarding others. Um, when, but regardless of this specific arrangement, the UK, and I'd like to, to stress that, um, played a key role in, in, in promoting and supporting the development of, of, of cooperation in criminal matters. And therefore, when the UK announced its intention to withdraw from the EU, 
uh, there was, as it has been stressed by others, um, a certain uh, fear or anticipation that this might, ha might have consequences on the degree of cooperation and, um, and, and um, uh, collaboration uh, in these fields. The withdrawal agreement uh, maintained to a certain extent the UK contribution to the main instruments and its participation into the main EU agencies and databases in, um, in the field. And very early in the negotiations, we, we saw that there was a strong reciprocal interest in maintaining a high level of cooperation, including in, in criminal matters. Uh, yet, this came with certain conditions, as it was mentioned by, 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 by other speakers before, notably a strong conditionality to this uh, future cooperation with the importance of data protection, but also the respect for the rule of law or the European Convention on Human Rights. And we see if we compare the um, regime that the UK now enjoys under the, the TCA and especially its part three, that um, the cooperation it can uh, engage in with the EU in criminal matters um, is again like a, a unique regime compared to what can um, be what has been granted or what has been negotiated with other uh, non-EU countries. Um, we see that the the, the UK um, benefits from certain specific uh, measures, uh, notably, for instance, regarding surrender that expand um, or re replicate to a certain extent the, um, um, the, the, the content of EU law instruments. But in other fields, we see a certain variation with um, the, um, the lack or that was something that was discussed extensively, the loss for the UK to the access to the Schengen information system and the uh, difficulties resulting from it. But still, uh, if you compare its uh, uh, cooperation with the EU, with the cooperation enjoyed by other um, non-EU countries like the Schengen Associated States or neighboring countries, um, we see that the UK really benefits from a um, sui generis uh, regime, so to say, where um, some provisions go, uh, I would say, uh, or more advanced than what is, for instance, granted to other uh, neighbors of the, of the EU, and especially to the neighbors who are not participating into the Schengen area and the uh, criminal um, uh, measures associated, associated with it. Um, what we discussed uh, today was, uh, we, we also discussed briefly the implementation of part three of the, of the TCA, and I won't come back to the uh, the fact that new questions are still arising and it's still not sure it's there are still discussions to see to what extent the level of cooperation that has developed since the the entry into force of the of the tca will remain the same um, but i just wanted to stress maybe one element which is the fact that um, even though the, the the tca and its part three are the main forum the main framework for the uh, cooperation between the eu and the uk in, in criminal matters uh, there are all other mechanisms of cooperation that remain relevant. Um, for instance, uh, we have a, a series of uh, uh, mechanisms that are supported by the EU, but not embedded as such in the EU legal framework. Uh, the field of counterterrorism or the exchange of intelligence between uh, partners is a, a, a good example for that. Uh, we have a series of informal clubs gathering EU member states, but also um, non-EU uh, countries. And uh, these forums are, are, are providing uh, very useful uh, platforms of cooperation and the uh, change of status uh, of the UK does not impact its capacity to continue to intervene and collaborate with its EU counterparts in, its, uh, in, in these forums. And as well, as it was also uh, hinted briefly by, 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 the, by uh, um, uh, Sir King in his uh, keynote speech, we see as well that there is um, development at the international level in which the UK can also contribute and the EU and interact with the EU in, in such um, international forums. Um, here we can use as an example the discussion regarding the access to electronic evidence as in parallel to EU internal, internal uh, negotiations on EU law instruments in that field. There is uh, negotiations at international level and they concluded just a, a few weeks, a few days ago with the adoption of a second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention on, on Cybercrime. Um, and these uh, developments uh, will also help and uh, uh, participate in defining new rules uh, regarding cooperation in criminal matters between EU member states and non-EU member states, including the, the UK. 
but this uh, doesn't uh, change uh, so much. Um, like this, these elements just stress, just uh, highlight the fact that even though the UK has, uh, has become a, a third country, um, it retains a close cooperation with the EU in, in criminal matters. Um, and I would just like now to, to turn briefly to, to um, the main purpose of the, of, the, of, the, of the discussion, which is to know uh, whether it's absence uh, and the fact that the UK is no longer participating in the EU area of, uh, in the EU area of criminal justice, whether the absence of the UK is felt. That was um, the, the, provo the provocative question asked by Elena earlier today. Um, and it's difficult to give a, a definitive answer at this stage. Um, and I thought I would just uh, pinpoint a few initiatives to, to stress that even though the UK is no, is, is not, uh, is no longer a part of the EU area of criminal justice, um, this EU area of criminal justice continues its own life. Uh, we had seen in the in the recent uh, months, recent years, um, like successful negotiations or like the launch of new instruments, new reforms um, on topics that are perceived as uh, priorities for the EU. Uh, we can think, for instance, of the reform of the Europol's mandate, um, which is very much discussed uh, uh, in uh, EU uh, circles. With the Trilogue, we started just uh, uh, this um, in, in late October 2021 which means to reinforce the mandate of the agency, uh, including to grant it an access to the Schengen information system and the capacity to enter uh, alerts uh, into this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this Schengen information system, which would be uh, a significant step uh, for the agency. Um, and we see as well that there are also definition of new strategic priorities to reinforce cooperation in criminal matters. The commission presented a few um, uh, months uh, ago, it's a strategy to tackle organized crime, where it announced a certain number of initiatives, uh, like, for instance, uh, a modernization and expansion of the impact uh, policy cycle at EU level, but also an upgrade of the PRUM uh, framework, or the um, ambition to draft and propose a EU police cooperation code. And these elements, um, like, have good chances to, to develop uh, even without the, the, the UK present to uh, support them. Um, and they have a present one risk for the EU-UK collaboration that was already uh, mentioned by, by previous speakers. The fact that the EU might intensify its collaboration among its members, they might develop new forms of cooperation, and the uh, content of the uh, provision in the TCA or in the, in the subsequent agreement signed with the UK might not reflect these new uh, forms of cooperation, the advancement that, that we witness within the, area, within the EU area of criminal justice. But nevertheless, and I'll conclude with two final remarks. Uh, the, the first one is that in all these recent uh, developments, the new strategies, the new measures that are being discussed and, and implemented, the external dimension of the EU area of criminal justice is very much present. Um, we see it with uh, instruments uh, like, for instance, the, the recently adopted regulation on um, uh, addressing uh, terrorist online content. Uh, like they include provisions with a, a large extraterritorial reach that may impact as well uh, UK um, authorities and or UK uh, private uh, operators. And we see as well uh, an interest of the EU to, to really support the external dimension of its cooperation with third countries and other partners. Uh, I also noticed while preparing uh, for today's event that just in July 2021, the uh, Council adopted uh, a decision for opening the negotiations uh, for a new agreement between uh, the EU and Interpol, including new uh, provisions on the exchange of operational information between Interpol and the EU agencies, Europol, Eurojust, and the EPPO, which might help um, also the, the, the cooperation between the EU and the, and the UK in this field. And to conclude, to, as, as a final remark, um, I wanted to stress also one element that has nothing to do with uh, the, the UK's withdrawal and that are challenges that are specific to the EU area um, um, that are very much internals, uh, but they might have again external uh, an, an external impact. And I'm thinking here, for instance, of the current rule of law crisis within the EU. 
and the fact that, for instance, uh, there are several uh, already judgments of the Court of Justice and several pending cases regarding, for instance, the future of European arrest warrant uh, issued by Poland and whether they might still be executed in light of the uh, um, lack of uh, judicial independence in that country. Um, we have already records of national decisions refusing the execution of uh, European arrest warrant issued by, by Poland on the basis of this argument. Um, and with the, the cases that are currently pending, we might have a situation where more and more often um, European arrest warrants are refused um, because of, this, uh, of the situation in Poland. And this may eventually uh, Concern, become a cause of concerns for the external partners of the EU, like the UK. Um, it was mentioned uh, previously that the TCA uh, contains references to the respect for the rule of law in as the general provisions, um, I would say, uh, constituting the, the, the basis of the cooperation between uh, EU and, and the EU and the UK in criminal matters. And we might see also this at the moment internal crisis uh, within the uh, EU area of criminal justice, touching also the, the collaboration between the UK and the EU with the possibility that UK authorities might as well um, refuse to execute or to uh, allow surrender of persons to Poland due to the um, situation in, in, in the country. And so I will conclude there. I hope I, I met the brief and uh, that this, um, uh, it provides new development to and further grounds for discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Chloe, for, for this excellent overview. Uh, I'm sure it, it raises a lot of uh, questions and uh, I hope we will have uh, time to, to discuss them. Um, I will now uh, leave the floor to, to Camino Motea uh, Martinez. Uh, Camino is a senior research fellow at the Center for European uh, Reform. She works on EU justice and home affairs with a particular focus on migration, data protection, internal security, criminal law, and police and judicial uh, cooperation. Prior to, to joining the, the CER, Camino worked in several projects uh, for the European Commission as part of the Justice and Home Affairs team of the Brussels-based uh, consultancy. And she also had different positions uh, related to, to EU affairs. So Camino, I will now leave you the floor. Thanks so much. I just realized I should have muted myself and I was not on mute. So fortunately, there is no crying baby anywhere uh, this time around. So that's good. Um, thanks a lot, Agat. And um, thank you, Chloe, for your very uh, interesting presentation, which is going to help mine because I'm trying to run away from Brexit as much as possible, although it always has a funny way of catching up with me. Um, so because of everything that has been happening recently, um, everything that I've been doing lately is working on um, rule of law issues and uh, migration crisis or not a migration crisis uh, on the border of Belarus and um, more in general on the future of the European Union's area of freedom, security and justice. So your remarks about Poland and about how uh, the Polish situation might impact in the long term the relationship between the UK and the EU are extremely extremely important and extremely useful. I think, to be honest, um, people in Brussels in general, we are sort of enjoying the relative quietness on the Brexit front because it's made our lives and our workloads much more manageable. Um, and in fact, I think every time there are breaking news headlines coming from London, sort of panicking, Brussels collectively shrugs its shoulders and masters, not again, please. So this is to say that at the moment Brexit it is, in my view, a much bigger thing for, for and in the UK than it is in Brussels, where we're all, as I said before, much more worried about things like soaring energy prices, COVID numbers, post-pandemic recovery, rule of law, and the standoff with Belarus dictator Alexander Lukashenko. Of course, EU officials and national governments worry about the UK government's threats to trigger Article 16, however irrational this man, this my sound, but we continentals have long accepted that there is nothing rational about Brexit um, anyway. My personal feeling is that Brussels is prepared to call the British government's bluff on this, and that should it happen, the EU will not hesitate to, retail, to retaliate, because after all, contingency planning for no deal Brexit was very advanced. 
And you might be wondering, why am I talking about Article 16? It's this all about trades. Uh, but to me, the very important thing about the whole Article 16 standoff between Brussels and London um, is that the European Union will not compromise on the rule of the European Court of Justice over the Northern Ireland Protocol. And this is, in my view, contrary to what many think, not an ide ideological or dogmatic position. It's because uh, sort of the ECJ's role um, in the building of the internal market, which is not something that I should be um, lecturing anybody about because you all know how important it is. Um, but also because the ECJ has been under attack um, from many fronts, as, as Chloe was saying. Um, and not last but not least uh, by Poland's bogus constitutional court. So there is a, a growing phenomenon in the European Union that I like to call the rise of the Eurosceptic courts, where we are witnessing how Supreme Constitutional Courts in Europe are calling out, calling out both the EU institutions and the ECJ for sort of overdoing their powers. Um, just a quick caveat to say that the police ruling, in my view, cannot be included in this trend for four reasons. Um, first, because the courts are legal. Second, because the ruling is questioning the very existence of the European Union and not the validity of secondary acts like directives or regulations. Third, the ruling goes against the interest of the Polish people instead of trying to defend them. And fourth, the ruling is against Poland's own constitutional law. The role of the ECJ will also apparently sadly play a major role in the French elections, courtesy of none other than former Brexit negotiation Michel Barnier. So the European Union wants and needs to defend the ECJ because all is not well with it. And ironically, neither it is uh, with the area of penal security and justice. So now to reply to Elena's question, um, whether the UK's absence is felt uh, in the AFSJ, I would say it is not yet, um, but not in the way some people might have hoped. So when Brexit was happening and right after Brexit, there was a lot of hope um, of you know, cheerleaders of EU integration thinking right now that the UK is out, we can perhaps you know, proceed with more ambitious plans for uh, cooperation in this area, uh, given that the UK has been uh, historically cherry picking or, or simply outright um, blocking stuff. Um, but actually, less than one year after the UK officially left the European Union, the reality, in my view, notwithstanding what Chloe was saying um, about uh, the true uh, advance on cooperation, on, on, on police cooperation. The reality, as I was saying, is that for me, the area of freedom, security and justice is in big trouble and that it is unlikely to continue in the same shape that it has now in the near future. And I know that you might be thinking out, oh, there is Camino there and her usual Spanish over dramatic predictions, but let me explain you why I'm so pessimistic about the future of the area of freedom, security and justice uh, now that the UK has left and not necessarily because the UK has left. In my view, every single EU crisis over the last decade, be it the Eurozone, migration, or um, the rule of law, is the byproduct of a growing lack of trust between its member states. And that applies to Brexit as well, by the way. Each one of those crises has in turn fed suspicious and made countries more wary of each other. Not all the crises, of course, originate in the European Union's deficient, in my view, deficient, just a home affairs arrangements, but all of them have had a big impact on the bloc's area of freedom, security, and justice. For example, European migration politics have been toxic for many years now. They continue to be toxic, and that's the reason why um, we have a, a geopolitical border crisis, not a migration crisis, um, on the border with Belarus at the moment. Brexit was and remains an activist project, which is based on a hardly disguised dis, dis, dislike of some European migrants, and then fear and suspicion of others have also filled conflicts between member states on everything from how many people should be allowed to enter the union to how to deal with those who are already there. The rule of law crisis that we were talking about may have been brewing for a while, but the migration debacle, in my view, accelerated it by pitching governments against each other. And as I was saying before, courts everywhere are questioning other countries' laws, and so I'm becoming um, openly Eurosceptics. And now we have COVID. So in an acute crisis like the COVID pandemic, member states' first instinct was to close borders and to stockpile or confiscate emergency equipment. The, even the European Union's landmark post-pandemic recovery fund was hard to agree, largely because of trust issues. 
I think that there cannot be an area of freedom, security, and justice without trust. But trust requires a certain level of accountability that member states have not really been able to reach. And I don't think this is necessarily the result of bad faith. I think there is more simply a general lack of understanding of what the union's area of freedom, security, and justice is, and an astonishing lack of ambition to make it clear. And obviously, eventually, this is a big problem because if Europeans do not find a way to restore reasonable levels of trust between themselves, uh, the European Union's fault lines, so west, east, north, south, or whatever a combination of, of those you want, to, you want to have, will deepen and citizens will see no point in having open borders and more cooperation with countries they distrust. I do not want to end on a negative note, so let me finish by telling you that I think there is a way forward that will take some serious revamping of the way the European Union thinks about the area of freedom, security and justice, starting by admitting that Schengen and the AFSA rights and obligations are inseparable. And this, until this is done, I'm afraid we'll be facing many more shocks to the area of freedom, security and justice, which will make Brexit fail in comparison. And sorry for, for having been a little bit off topic, but I, I think it's important to know also that um, we're facing a, a sort of a, a, a you know, troubled future for the, for the area of human security and justice, which will impact in the way that we cooperate with the UK, as Chloe was rightly saying before. Thanks. Thank you, Camino. I think uh, it was it was very interesting, and I'm looking forward to listening to to the debates. I will offer you, of course, some time, Chloe, to, to react to to Camino. I think it would be very uh, interesting. Um, we uh, will now listen to to Florian Troner, who will be our last um, speaker today. So uh, Florian is a director of the Research Center for Migration, Diversity, and Justice, and he also holds the Jean Monnet Expand. Uh, explaining resilience in EU justice and home affairs. So I think the resilience uh, word now uh, makes a lot of sense and is very interesting after having uh, listened to, to Camino. So uh, together with uh, Ilke Adam, Florian also coordinates the uh, Vraj uh, University Brussels Interdisciplinary Center of Expertise on Migration and Minorities. And uh, his research is interested in the European integration process with a focus on EU asylum, migration, forcible return, and counterterrorism uh, policy. And um, Florian is also a regular visiting professor at the College of Europe at uh, Natalin Campus. So thank you very much, Florian, for, for being here uh, today. And now the floor is yours. Thanks, Akat, for the nice introduction. Thanks for everybody for preparing the ground for my intervention very nicely. I think it was really fascinating debates in the morning and now and being the last speaker, I think my challenge is quite high. Uh, but I think I can actually follow on quite smoothly to what Camino has said uh, uh, in parts of the speech because I will really focus on the new EU pact on migration and asylum and its relation there with the UK. So uh, I will try to be a spoiler, make the three most important points straight in the beginning and then expand on them. So I think they are important, but very difficult negotiations within the EU to find a more functioning asylum uh, and migration system. They are very contested view on what kind of solidarity EU member states may have to give. And it's very difficult to over overcome these differences. And thirdly, there are close to zero expectations that the, in the EU, among EU member states, that the UK will contribute to inner European solidarity tools. The EU is perceived as being on the demand side of getting solidarity, not on the supply side of providing it. I think that's the three points that I would make, uh, and I will uh, go uh, point by point. First point is the, the migration, at the new pact of migration and asylum has been proposed in September 2020, so a bit more than a year right now. Uh, it's a key project for uh, making the migration asylum system more crisis resilient. I know we have a resilience term there as well. And it should replace the failed reform of the migration policies post-migration crisis 2015, 2016. So just to briefly recall back then, uh, the Commission and other member states wanted to stop the wave through approach of migrants. So they made a few 
kind of measurements, uh, the hotspot approach to stop migrants there. And in exchange, they offered to make an emergency relocation scheme for Italy and Greece. It was adopted against the explicit wish of some Eastern European states. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, they didn't implement any of the relocations from Greece and Italy, so Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, and so on. Hungary even had a national referendum in it. Post this emergency relocation scheme, the EU wanted to make a, a permanent relocation scheme in a revised Dublin regulation and to reform the other asylum laws as well. They were treated as a package with one another. Uh, the, the negotiations lasted for several years. But it became more and more clear that uh, it would be not possible to overcome the resistance of some Eastern member states that were later joined by Austria, Denmark, and a few, few others implicitly supported their arguments too. So basically, there were the European Parliament election of 2019, and the, there was no vote on this migration package. The new commission said, OK, we have to restart afresh. They uh, withdraw the whole package uh, presented post 2015, 2016, and they propose this new migration pact, which has right now a different approach. There is no longer uh, a focus on mandatory relocation, which has been such a controversial issue, but a focus on flexible solidarity, flexible but mandatory solidarity. This implies that if a state is not willing to uh, basically provide solidarity, they can do uh, to provide relocation, they can do other things in particular, uh, engage more in the return of irregular migrants. Uh, this is one important thing. They can also do some operational support, but uh, return or relocation are the two major choices that member states may face. Uh, some other key elements are that much more should happen directly at the border of the EU, mandatory screenings, accelerated procedure, stronger uh, empowered EU agencies uh, directly there. Uh, and if there is a, a quicker uh, selection at the border, this implies that people who are not entitled to stay should also be returned quite quickly to third countries. So the pact also builds on the idea that third countries will do more to cooperate with the EU on migration issues. Uh, and if they are not convinced by money or close association or whatever, they will face more negative conditionalities, uh, in particular, stricter visa regimes for all of their citizens. So the key idea of the new pact is that everybody has to do a bit more. All member states, uh, countries of transit, countries of origin, and then it could work. And if they don't want to be more on the liberal side of the asylum field, then uh, they should do more on the restrictive uh, uh, components, in particular, the return of irregular migrants. So I'm coming to my point two already, uh, uh, is this concept uh, right now, or the contested views on solidarity. Because in a way, the Commission came quite a far way towards the preferences of Eastern Europeans and others, said, OK, mandatory relocation is no longer in. but and this is a very big but, uh, the issue has remained for the EU and for Italy and Greece and other border states, what to do with migrants that are physically there, physically deaf. And the physically transfer away of these migrants has remained an issue. The commission, and I mean, many member states believe if you don't regulate it, there will be a kind of an informal, undocumented secondary movement within the European Union. So they say we have to, regulate this as well. And the idea is this return sponsorship. So the return sponsorship is that, concrete example, there would be a group of Nigerian migrants who return to Nigeria. They are in Sicily and Belgium says, I'm the return sponsor. So this group would remain in Sicily. Belgium will help the Italian authorities. The Italian authorities remain legally in charge. They will help these legal authorities to find, I don't know, documentation to return them, to set them uh, the financement of an assisted voluntary return program, to co uh, cooperate with, with Frontex to actually return them. So this is a bit the key idea. But and if the return is not working, uh, after eight months, this group of migrants has to be brought away from Sicily to Belgium. 
So there is a time limit of eight months, and if there is a big influx of migrants, this may be reduced to four months, according to the Commission's proposal. So there should be a uh, uh, there should be or there could be a transfer away of irregular migrants, and this has become a, a very sticking point in the negotiations. Uh, there have been messages such as. Uh, return sponsorship is a kind of a relocation through the back door and there is still this kind of uh, imposition that we are moving there uh, so for the states that were very critical to relocation uh, the new ideas proposed in the return sponsorship do not fly really neither uh, and on the other side the states at the border they say it's very risky that this will all not work out well uh, it should happen already after two or four months that the migrants are brought away uh, after you know they have a, a removal order. Eight months is far too long. Uh, so and the, the other risk is that the commission set up a very flexible concept so that the, the member states can choose which nationality they want to return and all these things. So the, the border states fear that those nationalities that are very difficult to return no one will take over responsibilities and in the end they will have quite some high numbers uh, of people for which they are responsible so this is a bit the the the, the, the key challenge is there uh, it seems very difficult that they are bridged uh, the positions are already quite entrenched uh, it seems more likely right now that the commission is going away from a package approach and is negotiating piece by piece and it may be that this remains over, but then it's not in the interest of the border states to do so. So it's 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 complicated, and it's not sure that this new package will actually come to a conclusion. It could be, but uh, it's it's it remains very difficult negotiations. Uh, and just to say, because I mean, you can talk it in a discussion as well. I was recently in a, in a panel discussion with the head of DJ Home. Uh, and we discussed, you know, I asked him, but what would happen to the situation right now in Belarus? And he said, actually, they discussed it internally in the commission. And they say that the, the new pact that didn't really provide any answer to what the EU could and should do in the situation than we have right now at the Polish-Belarusian border. So I think the, the, the experience that the member states and the commission are making right now in the, in the Belarusian border will also uh, quite uh be incorporated let's see in the negotiations in the in the uh that are to come so right now i'm coming to the final point where's the uk in all this uh, so in preparation for our talk i looked at the communication for the new pact on migration and asylum the uk is mentioned twice uh, both cases refer to statistics in which a footnote says this figure does no longer include uk data that's it so there is no reference for the UK whatsoever, apart from this uh, disclaimer. Uh, other third countries were mentioned more prominently, just to give an example, Turkey has seven entries in this communication. So the UK is really not very high up in the mines, uh, in particular in the asylum field. I mean, it was very well known that the UK was super happy with the Dublin regime, which gave a legal tool uh, for uh, to send asylum seekers back to other EU countries. Uh, the law no longer applies since the end of 2020. Uh, so right now it's the big question, what shall be done? Uh, the UK has expressed its intention to agree bilateral deals with EU member states. Uh, and right now there are other deals. I mean, partly they have been mentioned in the morning already that, that there should be uh, pushbacks to France and all this kind of, you know, this kind of restrictive measures that can be implemented also unilaterally without the cooperation uh, for EU member states. But Principally, the EU is striving for uh, creating bilateral deals with some key member states. Uh, but I mean, I haven't done really in-depth research there, so I, I cannot claim that I, I can talk for all EU actors. But at the risk of simplification, the general view is that the EU is actually cooperating with its demands. Uh, just to have some numbers, in 2020, there were around six asylum seekers for every 10,000 people living in the UK. In the EU 27, this were almost double, namely 11 asylum seekers for every 10,000. When compared with EU countries, the UK ranked 14th 
out of the individual countries in terms of the number of asylum applications per capita. So from the perspective of many EU member states, the asylum situation in the UK is absolutely not very dramatic. Uh, and there should be a handling of the asylum situation by themselves. And if they find the people are not eligible, they can send them back to the countries of origin, but not to other EU countries. Uh, so uh, there is, I think, very little appetite uh, to have uh, on top of very complicated EU internal negotiations, the UK being a demandeur of sending back asylum seekers to other EU states. Uh, so the EU uh, is not seen to contribute solidarity uh, in, in the field, at least at present, but to ask for solidarity. Uh, and this in a context in which the UK EU negotiations are going uh, not very well, as almost uh, or as most panelists have, have, have highlighted in one way or another. So it's a cooperate. It's an area in which cooperation is likely to be very low, uh, and uh, there is. I mean, I don't see uh, a high probability that this will change even in the midterm future. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Florian. Maybe I will uh, leave you now some time uh, following the, the order of, of presentations to react to uh, what the, the others um, talked about. So uh, I'll start with you, Chloe, if you, if you want to take a couple of uh, minutes, maybe to, to react to, to Camino and uh, Florian's talks. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Uh, I think the, the, the thing I would like to stress is like maybe it's um... Uh, we are not so far in disagreement uh, about the, the situation, uh, but I, I wanted to, to stress maybe one thing that uh, may explain why maybe the, the cooperation in criminal matters differs from cooperation in migration matters, um, is the fact that like, the, the, the cooperation in criminal matters is based on like instruments that for some of them have a long standing existence. If you think of the European arrest warrant, it has almost uh, 20 years of, of, uh, of existence nowadays. And um, these instruments, especially those based on the, the principle of mutual recognition, they are um, based on this idea of direct collaboration between judicial authorities that are supposed also to have a certain independence, a certain I would say uh, also offer certain guarantees in terms of uh, protection of rights and uh, and, uh, and and freedoms, um, but that, that's where I, like, where I think we, we we are not in so far in disagreement is that I already I share the idea expressed by by, by Camino that like there is a, a certain a growing lack of trust between uh, between EU member states and it's also visible in the in the EU area of criminal justice like the. The situation in Poland is just a recent example, and it's like maybe one of the most challenging at the moment because um, I didn't have the time to, 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 to discuss it, but we saw like a change first in the case law of the Court of Justice that admitted for the first time that you could refuse the execution of European arrest warrant on grounds that were not foreseen by the, the decision, uh, by the framework decision itself. And we see also nowadays, like especially in the last months, new um, uh, cases being brought before the courts, challenging its previous uh, uh, judgment, saying like, yeah, you should drop your, your, the, the test that is considered to be too severe and just uh, uh, consider that there is no need for an individual assessment of the risk of a violation of a right to a fair trial. Um, we should just consider that the situation in Poland is so dramatic that all uh, a person surrendered to that country might be subjected to a risk of an infringement of their, of their fundamental rights. Um, and, and it's something that is, that is a, a really um, uh, important and, 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 like an, and, and I would say a source of worry for, for those who, who follow the, the development of the EU area of criminal justice. But yet still, I, I, I think um, there is still maybe one, like, and I think it's the major difference to what has been discussed in relation to migration that at least like since most of the instruments are about uh, promoting cooperation between um, national authorities to protect like to um, uh, fight against crime and protect internal security there is still a common understanding among member states that there would be an added value to see new instruments adopted etc so it's 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 um like if you think about europol mandates for instance 
uh, there are criticism to, to be made uh, because it's like a reinforcement of its uh, capacities. It's a, a further, I would say, securitization of, uh, of, of EU uh, cooperation in that field. But member states seem to be kind in agreement with it. And like the European Parliament can, can try to insert, like to push for certain provisions, certain guarantees on accountability, oversight, et cetera. But there is not maybe like uh, in the field of migration, this um, broad, I would say, distance uh, among member states on what should be done uh, to, to like further develop uh, EU cooperation. But I, I'm looking forward to hear what uh, Camino and Florian thinks about, think about it. Thank you very much. Um, Chloe, Camino, do you want to say a, a few words? Yeah, so first of all, very quickly to uh, respond to Chloe's uh, latest point in Europol. I actually think Europol is a uh, European Union success story that has thrived uh, thanks to differentiated integration in a way, um, which includes the UK. Um, so it's a, it's a very valued agency that the European Union could be using for to further some foreign policy goals uh, because of how much value um, other countries and now the UK as a you know third country, but also the US and others place on it as opposed to a declining interest in Interpol for obvious reasons. So that's um, that I agree with you that the, if you want the, the, the European um cooperation on, on on police police cooperation the the, the criminal cooperation area um, is doing better than other parts of the area of freedom security and justice but i do think that you know when we talk about the european arrest warrant but also the european investigation orders all these instruments which are effectively um judicial cooperation yeah, even though you know they, they they sort of like originate from police um from police um investigations and stuff um are going to have a are going to 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 be impacted majorly by uh by this lack of trust um so that's one thing the second thing i wanted to note uh, was that we are we, the three of us are in brussels right and um we are each in our house because of COVID. um but you can really see and i think it's just very interesting i couldn't go to the first session and sorry for that but i think it's very interesting to see that when we're discussing the future of the area of human security and justice and relations with other countries, in this case, the UK, most people here, as I was saying before, are worried about rule of law, migration, Belarus, and other things, and not so much about the UK, because I have the feeling that especially in the parts, in the C part of the TCA, so the cooperation part, we sort of have the feeling that Brexit is done. The cooperation is there, that it could, it, it could and will get better at some point, but now is not the time because of how relationships are not necessarily very good with the governments. Um, but I think it's, it's actually really interesting how, how you know, like the interest in Brussels has shifted elsewhere. And then I have a question um, for, 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 um, for all of you, because I mean, I was wondering, so, so there are two things which I think are interesting. Um, if, um, you know, we get to a point because we, we never know with the Brexit process, right? We get to a point where the European Union considers suspending the trade and cooperation agreement for whatever you know thing might happen on the other side. What will happen with the cooperation part of it? That's something that you know legally you could suspend the cooperation part of it uh, while you suspend the trade part of it. Um, but I think that that would be you know a, a bit of a, a shoot in in the in the arm for, for a shoot in the, in the in the foot for the European Union. So I don't know what your opinion is about that, guys. And then also. Uh, this very interesting question about the rule of law. So we're talking more and more about the rule of law in Poland, in Hungary, or elsewhere. But we have been seeing uh, some, you know, questionable practices in the UK Parliament uh, lately. I'm of course not going to go far uh, as far as to say that the UK Parliament or the UK is, you know, um, is experiencing democratic backsliding or is anywhere near Poland. But I think it's a very interesting question to ask whether or not the behavior of you know the uk government uh, in some areas could also trigger the european union to question part of the cooperation uh, it has when it comes to judicial cooperation and all these sort of things and also what chloe was saying which i thought was really interesting uh, what will happen if say you know the european union decides to sort of like stop part of the european arrest warrant to poland um, and then the UK continues exciting people to Poland. What will be the, the impact, the impact of that 
on UK-EU relations? I think, I mean, these are thorny questions and I'm not sure we have an answer, but I think they are interesting. Um, pretty academic uh, for the moment, but possibly something that might worry us uh, in the future. Thank you very much, Camino, and thank you also for, for raising if you want to, to answer to these questions or, or more broadly, if you, if you want to add something to, to this debate before we go with external questions. I, I can be very quick because I agree uh, mostly <laughs> to what my colleagues just said. And, and generally, I, I think what Chloe said is, is, is a very relevant point as well that the dynamic in judicial area probably very different to the migration field and uh, uh, here, but done. just a question, I mean, if I can add myself a question, because you mentioned Europol, but I got, I mean, you have worked a lot in Europol as well. I was talking back then during the negotiations with the agreement that there was a lot of concerns that everything that is given to the UK would the next day to be asked for by the US uh, among the, the EU side that uh, the negotiations with the UK were kind of overshadowed by the kind of concerns what could be the, the relationship with the US I mean can you elaborate if you have any experience yourself is this I mean what's the US and the UK EU's criminal justice area how is this working out so far I mean I haven't followed up myself so I would be interested to hear your view then um, and then what Camino said about Schengen, and this is kind of inseparable from the wider migration field. I think logically this makes a lot of sense, but I think practically it's almost insurmountable legal hurdles to get this done. Uh, I think you, you need a new treaty basis, and I don't think that this is uh, really on the on the plate. In general, I think. What is really a problem in these issues right now and more widely for the EU is that all the issues, they somehow, I very quickly refer to the European Council, the head of states and governments, uh, also with Poland and full of law and the migration dossiers, the last ones. And then in the, you, you have quite quickly a consensus that this should be, you know, more or less decided by unanimity among the state, head of states and you basically undermine the ordinary legislative procedures relatively quickly. Uh, and that's why several of these backlogs and polarization issues, in my view, have become so salient because the head of states, they, they took over certain issues uh, in which if you are, I mean, if you believe in a, in a a kind of a democratic ordinary rule of law decision making process at European level they shouldn't have done I think that's uh, okay but I think I will stop already here because I see Lena is already waiting urgently to come in so I think we may give her the floor as well or I mean you are the chair I can't. <laughs> thank you very much uh, Florian and I think that's uh, something also very interesting about uh, US UK e EU relationship. I think we all already talked a lot about this this morning, but we see that it's also coming back in this in this panel about the about the EU. So I hope we have time to to think about it and to talk about also Interpol. It seems that it could be uh, something quite new also in, in this field. Um, so I will now uh, let uh, Elena ask uh, her questions. Thank you so much. Um, I know I'm not part of the panel of this panel for Moise, but I, I still want to you know, take advantage of my uh, uh, not chair position in this case uh, uh, to actually ask a few questions. And it's just easier to actually formulate them orally if, if that's all else. Um, so I, in, first, I'd like to actually make a comment that actually I think was, I want to say thank you to the panel because uh, not just for, you know, coming, spending, you know, taking time to actually talk to us, but actually because these remarks are so sobering for uh, uh, someone who's so embedded in the UK reality, right? Um, and it's a pity that actually our, our speakers of this morning actually didn't join uh, for this afternoon because actually this would have been, maybe it would have come as a shock for most of them to actually think, well, you know what? Brussels has moved on. It's not that interested because we continue to actually, you know, if you scroll through BBC News, it's just an example, you'll see that actually continue to be mainly obsessed with Brexit and what's, you know, whether it's fishing or whether it's migration, you know, it's it continues to be on, on the headlines permanently. 
so it's actually really quite sobering and quite humbling to actually, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's be told that actually, oh, you know what, it's not that relevant anymore. Um, and so I wish that actually that message would also pass through uh, to, 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 to more UK-based uh, colleagues. Uh, in, I do have a question for, for each of you and then a final question, which is more general. For, I'll go in, in the same order as before. So, Chloe, uh, thank you so much for your for your presentation and um, which you know is very rich in details. And, and I was just wondering about the mechanisms, in particular in, in relation to counterterrorism, the informal ones that you mentioned. Um, the obviously a lot of it is based on on a culture of trust, right? So, if we consider that, if we take that into consideration, do you think that actually the UK will continue to be able to access those mechanisms? Uh, because that is one of the main concerns that I have in the in the uh, panel before uh, this one, we were just talking about the uh, the impact that Brexit has had on socialization of the different actors in the sense that actually, uh, whether it's MPs or practitioners, actually, they have less of a socialization process with their European counterparts, which leads to uh, uh, less of access to informal discussions to uh, you know, it's a reduction in the share of best practices of, of just basically being in the in the know, basically. So I, I just wanted to hear your, your thoughts about that. For Camino, um, I was really puzzled. Um, thank you so much for a really, really, you know, very direct message. I think that was really, really useful. Um, and I, I was a bit puzzled by your um, your idea that actually the EU is ready to call the bluff of the UK. I know that obviously rhetorically it says it is, but I would like to question whether it actually is going to do that in practice. Because if we look at the uh, like a path, basically, uh, um, we, we if we think in terms of path dependence, almost we see the EU kind of giving in to the UK ev at every stage. So not just you know prior to Brexit, where you know the the area freedom sphere and the, the opt-ins and opt-outs are a good indication of that. Uh, uh, which probably built up the UK's confidence in terms of you know what it could actually get or not from this negotiation in in this area specific of internal security. But also even now, if we think about the Northern Irish, uh, um, the Northern Ireland Protocol, basically it's the EU saying, "Oh no, you know, please be aware that I will not give in this time," and it's the UK kind of pushing, 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 and the EU saying, "Okay, fine." I will give this in and again and again. So it really um, it really makes me think that actually, uh, you know, the EU is ready to call the bluff rhetorically, but not really in practice. But I, I'd, I'd love to hear from you on this. Then in terms of, um, of for Florian, uh, so that's, that's a great, great talk. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was wondering, uh, I, I do think that actually, I completely agree, I could not agree with you more in terms of the way the UK is going to go about in terms of building bilateral deals, basically, that clearly see, seems to be that the direction it's taking. And so I was wondering, actually, uh, if you, to, I'd love to hear your reflections on the fact that, uh, I don't know if it's made it to um, uh, the news on the continental side, but the UK has just sent troops to the Polish border to help, and this is how it's phrased, to help po uh, Poland reinforce its border. Uh, and so obviously they're not combatant troops, they happen to be engineers, but in this case, it, it doesn't really matter. It's basically about helping Poland directly protect its border, protect its sovereignty against these, you know, against the weaponization of migration on the other side of the border. So this is how it's being framed. So I'd like to actually hear your views about, you know, what kind of, what, is, if, is this going to be like a, uh, if you see this as being a, the beginning of a, a strategy for the UK to actually, you know, engage bilaterally. And then uh, just a general uh, thing, general uh, view is that, um, general question, the a lot of you have worked on the external dimension of adjustment home affairs. So the fact that the UK is now shifting to the EU's external dimension of adjustment home affairs, I was wondering whether this is actually going to lead to any change of direction of that external dimension. It possibly not, but I would actually like really love to hear if you know obviously there's different areas of the external dimension, but will this actually lead to a, a change in direction of the external dimension? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lena. I would maybe just 
ask a little bit, a little question uh, to to Chloe too, and it will complement um, the question about socialization of uh, Lena. It's really uh, an open question. So, have you heard anything about uh, maybe creating more uh, staff exchanges or common uh, trainings in terms of uh, criminal matters uh, in between the EU and, and the UK to maintain this uh, socialization and this professional uh, ties? Thank you. Should I start to, to reply then? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I tried to, to took notes of all the questions that, that were raised, and, and I will, I will uh, try maybe to, to answer to the remarks made by, by, by Camino and Florian, um, like quickly about the, the, the rule of law and the fact that the, like the situation regarding the respect for the rule of law in the UK might be a cause of concerns for the EU partners. Uh, just in, 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 in a sentence, I think there the key word is uh, reciprocity, uh, is that the, the thing is the uh, EU itself uh, is not so well placed to give lectures necessarily to, to other uh, countries. And it's something that has been raised, like I had the occasion to read things about, for instance, the um, EU-US negotiations or EU-Canada negotiations where external partners would like stress like the certain, like let's say, uh, ambiguous position of the EU or difficult position of the EU that internally there are issues regarding the, the respect for the for the rule of law and it's a bit difficult to uh, blame your partners when within your own um, system you have countries that are violating these uh, these standards and uh, um, like regarding the question of what would happen if uh, a Polish uh, European arrest warrant are suspended in a way by the Court of Justice uh, I think here again, I, I come back to my point that um, like it's it's this uh, decisions on surrender are taken by judicial authorities, and and we see even nowadays, even if, even though the Court of Justice has still its kind of I would say um, reserved or nuanced approach to the like like general suspension of of uh, um, European arrest warrants issued by by the UK, you do have individual decisions by national courts, by judicial authorities in Germany, Sweden. Um, and also in the UK, before even uh, the, the UK withdrawal, where, where surrender was refused on the ground that uh, a surrender might lead to a violation of the person's fundamental rights. So I think it's it, like, regardless of what the Court of Justice might decide, there would still be individual assessments carried out on, on a case by case basis and national uh, judicial authorities might still consider in a given case that there is um, no need to wait for uh, a, a judgment in Luxembourg that the refusal can already take place and it has already happened. Um, on the question by, by, by Florian uh, on the, what, like the, the impact of EU-UK cooperation on EU-US uh, and EU uh, and like the, the global cooperation, um, I'm afraid I haven't had much opportunity to, to research it either, so I, I wouldn't have much, uh, much to say. Um, but what is what is noticeable is uh, I think the 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 fact that um, the the UK obtained a certain specific regime, but also like and it's as also and it's something that was discussed this morning, as you as you, as you have probably heard as well, that it had also tried to develop its own policy vis-à-vis -vis the, the the USA. Uh, if I speak, for instance, like of, of the field of uh, electronic evidence, that the opportunity to to work on a bit um, the um, like in parallel to the EU internal negotiations and the multilateral one in the Council of Europe, there has been also discussion between the EU and the US regarding the uh, bilateral agreement between the USA and, and, and the EU um, on the basis of the US Cloud Act uh, and the possibility to obtain uh, evidence uh, on that basis. Um, the UK was very prompt to sign a bilateral agreement with the US without waiting for the EU negotiations to, to, um, to conclude and to obtain its own specific regime and its own basis for cooperation with the USA, regardless of what's happening with the EU. And, and I think it's just a field that, that deserves more closer attention um, because I, I imagine as well that what the UK might obtain uh, or like the inference it might exercise in Europol or with, with agencies uh, as it does nowadays, might be looked at very um, with much interest by other partners like Canada or, or, or the US for sure. And so I think it's just an occasion for another uh, workshop uh, uh, in, in the coming months or years uh, to discuss it more, more extensively. 
Um, and then coming to the to the question on socialization um, and, and, and an answer to, to both for uh, I get and uh, to your question and, and the one by, by Elena. Um, I agree that uh, I, I think that there is a key element and, and it's, it's I think it's something that has been well researched, especially in the field of security studies, how the socialization and the fact that practitioners have occasions to meet and, and collaborate together helps to build uh, a trust and also a common culture that sometimes make them more, I would say, uh, loyal to their counterparts in other EU countries than vis-a-vis -vis your, your colleagues in their own uh, uh, state. Um, I think like the, the, the impact of uh, the, the, the UK withdrawal, it's, um, I, I, I wouldn't know. I, I think the impact might be felt maybe later. I have the impression that, I mean, but you know maybe better than me uh, if you followed closely the, the discussion in, in the UK side, but I have the impression that since from the practitioners there, there is a strong, there was a strong socialization with EU partners before and the, the ties, the links are still there. Um, and they might um, be maintained for a certain time. But again, as it was discussed this, this, this morning, um, the, the, I fear that beyond the, the, the trust between practitioners that they have built over the time of a, of a collaboration, the um, overall uh, relationship between the EU and the UK might play a role. And that was what was brought up uh, already this morning. The fact that you have tensions uh, between like France and the UK that, uh, then make the, the relationship an issue of, of national security or at least like touches upon very um, core security concerns of the, of the country um, may have an impact on, on, the, on the socialization and the, and the, and the, and the, um, and sorry, and the, and the, and the trust between partners. And to answer your, your question, uh, uh, Agatha, I am not aware of uh, staff exchange program that are existing, but I think like the, the two agencies, like at least Europol, Eurojust, I, I know they have this, this staff exchange programs existing for a while, including for, for um, uh, practitioners based on non-EU countries. I imagine they might just keep them and include the UK among the, the possible uh, beneficiaries and, and that but might just be it. And just to finish without taking too much time on the last question of uh, Elena about whether the, um, there would be any change in the external dimension now that the UK is also a, a non-EU country. Um, from a purely like, uh, from the, the only the perspective of uh, cooperation in criminal matters, um, I think at the moment, I would say not necessarily in the sense that, um, like at least for instance, if you think about surrender of persons to, 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 to non-EU countries, um, there were precedents with Schengen associated countries of regime very close to EU law already granted to, 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 third, uh, to third countries. Um, but the, the difference might be felt maybe um, like for, for instance, regarding the activities of the agencies, for instance, I imagine that with, uh, for Europol, for instance, for, for which the, the UK has been a strong uh, partner, um, the evolution of the uh, legal framework and the facilitation of cooperation with third parties uh, might be something that is not is part, is in party uh, encouraged by the need to maintain a close cooperation with the UK, and maybe that would um, help uh, other 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 third countries later. But we'll, we'll see what what would be uh, discussed and adopted uh, at the end of the of the current negotiations. But I stop there. But I, I remain available for further discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Chloe. Cam Camino, do you want to react uh, to uh, Chloe's uh, answers, or do you want to also answer uh, Elena's questions? Sure. So. Um... There are two questions and one comment, like <laughs> in every conference. So I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually answering two questions and just making one comment, not asking two questions. So the first question is Elena's about um, the EU calling the bluff. And I'm reluctant to go into this because it's a hardcore Brexit discussion. It's, it's not about the, the, the EU area of freedom security and justice. It's just about, you know, the, the, the boring politics of, of, of it all and how if the UK went ahead and triggered Article 16, I don't think the European Union would, uh, at this stage, um, you know, like give up on the role of the, of the European Court of Justice. I, that was my point from the beginning, because uh, of how important European Court of Justice is for the internal market. So it's not 
a dogmatic question of any sort. It's, it has a major role because, as we know, the single market is by no means complete. Um, so the European Court of Justice has a very important role in plugging, in plugging the gaps of those laws which do not exist. So even if Northern Ireland is a small part of the, of the single market, so to speak, a very sui generis one, and is very um, linked, very much linked to an external country, which is the UK at the moment, uh, the, U the European Union uh, will not relinquish uh, the role of the European Court of Justice. So that was my point on why, you know, the European Union is prepared to call the bluff, because, you know, if Lord Frost uh, feels that is in his personal and political interest to trigger Article 16 to continue um, building a platform for his own political ambitions, uh, then, you know, the Brussels people who actually happen to read the newspapers <laughs> in English, um, then the Brussels people would say, okay, go ahead, because we had contingency planning anyway, and the worst that can happen is, you know, we can go from like really tiny little measures to suspend data adequacy, to suspend the whole uh, trade agreement, and we did have preparations for that, and, you know, we all know, um, like from a very factual point of view that it will be a disaster for both economies, but it will be much worse for the UK. So that was my point. I mean, and then this sort of like was the starting point on why the European Union also needs to defend the European Court of Justice and how the area of freedom, security and justice relies so much on the European Court of Justice. Um, I don't think the European Union has any interest whatsoever in stopping cooperation with the UK on, you know, criminal and judicial cooperation, the little judicial cooperation that there is, or cooperation at the external level on things like, for example, the Belarusian crisis. I think that, that it has been really good that the UK um, has been sort of behind uh, the European Union in a way in that crisis. Um, now, um, I would like to answer your question about the external dimension, but I'm not sure I understood it. So do you mean that because the UK, so because the European Union now has to negotiate um, quite a lot with the UK, which is a external country, once again, a third country, um, now we will be seeing more of the external dimension on, on, on of, the, of the European area of human security and justice, is that what you mean? Well, I, may, I probably didn't formulate myself, uh, formulate the question correctly. Sorry about that. No, I meant that, uh, so obviously there are currently specific strategies associated to the external dimension of just home affairs. Uh, and there's sub strategies related to migration, organized crime, etc. So I was wondering whether, you know, in any way, the UK entering that dimension is going to actually change the direction that you were thinking of, of doing, or is, is it just going to be like, you know, business as usual, just one more country as part of this dimension, and it will continue actually going in, or will there be, like, uh, will the UK actually take a very special place within that dimension, um, because obviously it's also geographically differentiated uh, external dimension, right, so yeah. will there be any impact on the external dimension at all? Yeah, I think I understand what you mean, but I think uh, my personal view is that sort of the external dimension of the area of freedom, security and justice has been entering the scene for a while and is mainly due to migration and security uh, reasons. So as far as I can say, uh, when I look at what the institutions or when I talk to people within the institutions, what they are doing about, you know, migration or security stuff, there is like the, the whole external dimension and the whole we are going to be so, you know, like foreign policy minded and whatever is basic, basically can be summarized and we want countries to help us with migration and security threats. Um, hence, my personal opinion is that, you know, the cooperation will be focused as it is at the moment on countries of origin and transit of migrants and countries which might pose sort of security threats. Of course, the security will probably become more salient as the French elections um, heat up uh, as a topic. I think, you know, cooperation between the UK, the US, and Europe on the European Union on certain uh, topics like certain topics like cybersecurity or you know hybrid threats and all these kind of things is going to be very interesting. But I think in terms of money and political capital, I'm pretty. I, mean, I would bet my money that the next few years is going to be much more about cooperating with those countries we need help with um, to sort of like stop the what we perceive as the migrant and security threats to Europe. So that's the second question. And then I had one comment on um, Chloe's uh, rule of law question and the ex extradition question, which I believe sort of like requires a whole different conversation that we will be having over a glass of wine or coffee if we were, you know, not in the middle of a pandemic. But my point on the, on the rule of law question and on the European arrest warrant 
Um, it's a very hypothetical one, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm making a mistake here because I haven't looked in, in detail at the instruments themselves. But my point was, was not what would happen with the test, with the European Court of Justice test, whether it will become ad hoc or will, whether, you know, national courts, uh, sorry, will, whether it will become permanent or, you know, national courts will continue to have ad hoc um, examinations of, of um, extraditions to Poland or even to the UK, as we have seen with Brexit. Or, or other countries. My question is, the UK and the European Union have a surrender agreement, which looks very much like the European arrest warrant, right? So it's like the European arrest warrant, you know, by name and three like differences, which are okay, are important, but it's still a pretty um, intense cooperation agreement. And as we said before, part of the reason why the UK and the, and the European Union cooperate is because there are, I mean, they have an agreement, is because there are some conditions like data adequacy, or you know, respect for the rule of law, blah, blah, blah. Now, what will happen if the European Union as a whole, like somehow through the European Court of Justice or via some sort of like, you know, consequence of an Article 7 procedure, which, you know, magically would <laughs> go ahead or any other, you know, we have a conditionality mechanism finding out, uh, you know, like evidences of the judiciary, or I don't know, or a country actually tell, telling, asking the European Commission, to suspend the European arrest warrant to Poland. I don't know how it could happen, but these kind of things will happen. So imagine that we have a complete hold of surrenders to Poland, but we still have a surrender agreement with the UK, which has not stopped sending people to Poland. And this question arises as well with the US and, and death penalty, right? So the onward transfers, like it's the onward transfers of data, but in this case would be the onward transfers of people. So how would that work? That, that was like one of, of, the, of the rule of law, you know, angles that we can take when thinking about the UK, uh, because of course the European Union cannot lecture anybody about rule of law uh, <laughs> since it's now dealing with its own problems. But I was just wondering, you know, like this may cause a problem at some point. And as you know, both countries diverge a little bit in the ways they deal with what was happening in Poland, which can happen because of, you know, we don't know what, the Boris Johnson government is going to do tomorrow, so who knows? Sorry, Sorry very quick <laughs> question. Uh, do you mean, uh, just a point of clarification, would the agreement between Poland and UK be the, a bilateral one, or would it be about the new surrenders? Would it go through the new surrender system? Which one? I uh, Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a good question. And the answer would be different, depending on, on whether you're thinking of a bilateral agreement or whether you're thinking of the sur a new surrender system. So what, what would happen with a bilateral agreement? Nothing. Nothing at all. The bilateral agreement would be, would, obviously I'm not a, a EU a legal scholar and actually Elaine would be really well positioned for this, um, <laughs> but nothing would happen to the bilateral agreement because it's, it's a national, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a bilateral national agreement in the sense that it has nothing to do with the EU. Um, whether the ECJ actually weighs on any bilateral agreements just because there's a member state involved, I'm not entirely sure. Because if we think of there's certain bilateral agreements that have continued, um, like Le Tuquet agreements, one and two, between France and the UK, right? The migration management ones. I don't think the ECJ has a, a, a say on them. So I would say that if it's just bilateral between Poland and the UK, nothing would happen. And um, which would be quite ironic, I'd say. Uh, but if it's within the surrender system, then it would definitely have an impact. Well, what, what kind of impact? That's sorry. Sorry, I'm like I'm bringing the conversation into way too to techy stuff, and it's Friday afternoon. I understand. <laughs> I, I think it's a super interesting um, topic to to explore. Uh, you know, in a paper or something. <laughs> uh, the a surrender the, the new surrender system. I don't know enough enough about it really. So, but the the new surrender system would tries to mimic the European arrest warrants. Uh, it's limited, but it tries to mimic it. So, I would say that actually it would uh, if there was if there was a decision that actually Poland was not um, complying with uh, human rights uh, you know, legislation then I would imagine there'd be a consequence for Poland being suspended from that specific arrangement as well. As well, right. So it would be, okay, that's super interesting. I would, I would think so, but I'm very open to any legal scholars. If there's, uh, I think I see a legal scholar um, in, 
no, she was here. Marie O'Neill was here, but uh, she would have been also perfect to actually answer this question. Uh, but <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's definitely a, a question for a legal scholar to answer. Good. Sorry, and can I say the last thing that I forgot to say before, and then I, I shut up forever and I promise I leave. Um, Florian, I think your 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 um, insight about what the Director General for Home told you that you know no rule in the new pact of migration would have solved uh, the Belarusian question um, goes completely with my points that this is not a migration crisis uh, because there is nothing in EU law which could have made this better, uh, especially because Poland does not want to be helped. So, I mean, with that, it's just like I'm really upset of people, you know, going on and on about like how the failed European Union's migration policy has caused a, a major humanitarian uh, issue at the border with Belarus when this is all about a geopolitical crisis and a mismanagement at the border where the European Union has nothing to do because, I mean, the only thing that the European Union could have done possibly would have been to help Poland with Frontex and perhaps Yasso and, you know, perhaps with taking people uh, sort of like redistributing people in a way. Uh, but the main thing to do in this in this case is not to redistribute my, like asylum seekers, in my view, um, is to try to see how to stop the whole thing, because at the end of the day, these people are suffering and, and, and they're you're going to like sort of make them suffer even more if you give them more, more profit in a way. So, yeah, that's my last point. OK, thanks, yeah. if I, because it's your uh, insights actually fit nicely to Helena's question. So what is the UK doing there? Because what you say is perfectly right. And this is one of the more astonishing views if you look at this crisis from an external perspective. Uh, I think you could say, OK, the EU invests hundreds of millions or even billions of euros in the setup of a border agency that is located in an Eastern European countries. And then there is a border crisis uh, and there is an explicit attempt not to let any one of these border guards close to this area, uh, which as it said is relatively surprising. Uh, but I think it fits into a wider pattern of interaction between the Polish and government and the EU level. It's, uh, I mean, you mentioned also the issue of trust. I think the relation there is completely full of mistrust uh, and opposing interests as well. Uh, uh, and I think here we can link it to the question of Lena. Uh, what, how does the UK Polish uh, deal uh, sending some soldiers there to the border fit into this wider European issue? So I think it always depends what will actually happen there. I mean, two things first, because you said it was all over the media in, in the UK, that the UK is doing there. In the European media, at least what I saw, everything was today focused on Angela Merkel's call with Lukashenko and what she did. So it's really interesting to see as well that the debate on the issue are completely different on both sides of the panels. In the media that I read, there was not even any mentioning of such an agreement. It seems like a major issue. It was, you know, that, Merkel phoned and that Lukashenko started to fly back a few of these migrants to Iraq in particular, if I remember it correctly. So I think it's not considered as a, as a major issue by many capitals so far. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, it really depends what the UK wants to do. I mean, is the UK cherry picking a government that is super critical of the EU to undermine the EU? in another point, you know, and in the Brexit process more widely, then it will go down relatively badly, I think, in Brussels. Or is the UK seriously interested in finding a solution to a crisis situation? Uh, then it may be well received, I think, as well by others and it may help to see. But I think there are a lot of expectations that it's more the first way. I mean, uh, Johnson welcomed Orban as well once in London, so he's really cherry picking these governments that are known to be super critical of Brussels and the institutions uh, to, to, I mean, rule and divide uh, in the EU. So I think if it, that would be the case, uh, I don't think that this will uh, be the starting point for a range of bilateral agreements with other capitals too. So that's my, uh, my reading here. Okay, I think we have come to an end of our time, so I may stop actually here. Yeah. Thanks.
Th thank you very much. Uh, I, I had a couple of questions, but we, we don't have enough time. Um, but thank you very much for all these very interesting talks uh, and this very interactive uh, panel. I think it was it was nice to raise all these uh, questions. We were not able to answer all of them, but it, it's a good sign because uh, it seemed that we've got a lot of things to 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 discuss about. Uh, so thank you once again for for your time. Uh, thank you also to to the audience for for staying until the the end of uh, today's event. So we will uh, make sure that. Uh, you have the you received the, the policy brief that we're going to write with uh, Elna and, and Sarah and uh, have a nice end of the day and we hope we will see you soon. Uh, good luck with the situation in in Brussels. I heard not so good news, so uh, I hope that everything will go well. Thank you as well for me. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Good luck. Huh? Bye bye. 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 bye.